Um, so it's one o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to uh, the second session of the, this year's job search series. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few reminders for everyone. So um, today's session is being recorded and will be sent out to everyone who has registered for this session. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, please follow, uh, use the QR code or the link you see on the slide to register for the session. Uh, thank you to all of those who submitted questions ahead of time. Any questions, whether submitted um, ahead of time on the registration survey or placed into the chat today that we do not get to during the live session, uh, we will ask our panelists to type up answers to and we'll send this resource out uh, to all those who fill out our post-session evaluation survey. It should take less than uh, three minutes to fill out. The link for the evaluation survey, I will place intermittently uh, into the chat throughout today's session. And then um, once our session is wrapping up, I'll also pull up the QR code for that evaluation uh, survey. Uh, Zoom links for the upcoming sessions of the job search uh, will be sent out the week of those uh, sessions. So today's session is the private practice career panel. We have four panelists joining us today. Uh, first is Dr. Foster, uh, who is from Tampa, Florida. She did her residency and fellowship at CHOP and is currently the neonatology specialty medical officer at Pediatrics Medical Group. Uh, her interests include BPD and clinical leadership. Second, we have Dr. Uh, David Horst, who's from Kansas City. He did his residency and fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. He is currently a uh, practice director of pediatrics neonatology of Houston and the medical director of the Women's Hospital of Texas NICU. Um, his practice covers 15 NICUs in the Houston area um, from levels two through four. Uh, they have 55 neonatologists, 75 advanced practitioners, and 15 pediatric hospitalists. Uh, the Women's Hospital is the level four, um, having about 11,500 deliveries per year. Uh, his research interests include molecular mechanisms of bile flow and intestinal development. Third, we have Dr. Rachel Hyman. Heilman, sorry, she's from Arlington, Virginia. She did her residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, followed by fellowship in Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, she is currently at the Newborn Care Physicians of Southeastern Wisconsin as an attending neonatologist. She's also the NICU Medical Director at Aurora Sheboygan Memorial Medical Center. Um, she describes her practice as a single specialty physician-owned private practice group. Um, taking care of mostly community NICUs levels two and three. Her interests include quality improvement. Last, we have Dr. Uh, Matt Saxonhouse, who's from uh, Cronon Hudson, New York. He completed his residency and fellowship at Chan's Children's Hospital at UF. He is currently an associate clinical professor at um, an academic neonatologist at Le Levine uh, Children's Hospital, Wake Forest School of Medicine, the Charlotte campus, Atrium Healthcare. Um, academic here is in quotations as they are moving towards this, but they are still technically a private practice hybrid type group. Um, his interests include neonatal thrombosis, neonatal thrombocytopenia, neonatal platelet function. And our moderators for today's sessions are uh, Dr. Anisha Bhatia, who's our TCAN chair, and Dr. Katie Fritz, who's uh, one of our TCAN early career representatives. So please send um, both Anisha and Katie any questions that you may have during the session if you do not feel comfortable uh, placing those questions um, to the entire group. And with that, I will turn it over to them. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, Katie Fritz, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we know that through a fellowship, um, you get a really good idea of what life is like in academics and university-based practices, but we're really excited to um, have some fantastic mentors and panelists talk to you about about um, the opportunities available in private practice and how to get there. So we'll jump right into the questions because I know that there are a lot of um, fantastic questions that you'd like to hear about. Um, I will direct our first question um, to Dr. Horst um, and how should a fellow prepare his or her CV for private practice opportunities? 
Um, so I get to go first. So welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's a great chance to talk to a lot of the folks that are coming out. Um, and and uh, this is something I think I've said before, I really wish we would have had um, when I was coming out of fellowship. It's a, a real great resource. So um, the CV, um, it's, I, I would say, especially different from an academic setting when you're coming out of a university, um, I'll just think of how I would look at a CV. And, and one of the questions that I've heard before is, you know, how, how best to get that to somebody. I would encourage people to send things, um, email them directly to um, medical directors or leadership, um, especially um, I work with a pediatrics medical group. Uh, they have recruiters or we have recruiters. You can see from the way I just phrased that, that we, we try to do most of our recruiting ourselves. So I'd always encourage you to um, contact the directors directly. Um, the CV itself, we're looking at a little bit differently. When you're building a CV in a university setting, you're working towards promotion, you're trying to build your publications, you're trying to build your lab. Um, I was in that world for about four years at Texas Children's, and, and it's, it's a very different feel to it. You're trying to build something around yourself um, that you're going to continue to move forward and bring to other places. The CV reads very differently. When I'm looking at a CV, um, I, I don't expect it to be as long. I'm always interested in what things people have published, but when I'm reading the section of papers or what's been published or activities, I'm really just looking to see what somebody's interested in. I'm not looking at it so much to see um, how they're building um, project to project, that, that type of thing. Um, I'm really looking to see where they've been and, and, and as much as anything, focusing on their last job. So really, uh, I think I, I like to see what people have done most recently, because the next thing that I'm going to do is talk to everybody that you've been working with recently as well. So you'll do the usual thing where you're looking for patterns um, and how people have progressed through their career and where they've been. Um, but a lot of what I'll spend my time doing is focusing on um, the, the people that you know and the connections that you've made more recently. Um, so I think a shorter CV focused more on what your recent, accomplish, uh, recent accomplishments are is very helpful for me. I'd be interested to hear what the other folks have to say as well. I agree. Um, we in our practice are really looking for um, what people have done, particularly clinically, we're looking for people who are clinically competent, but also interested in leadership. We have a lot of opportunities for medical administration. And so we are looking for people who have experience in that and interest in that. In terms of fellows applying, I think sometimes there's an academically focused cover letter where there's a lot of specifics about your research. And if you're applying to a private practice that you know, doesn't continue that type of research, it's helpful to make sure that you can translate how your research um, translates to the bedside or can be an asset in clinical practice. I think those are the things that at least I'm looking for in our group. I think you, that's, I mean, it's, it's a good point. What you're saying is how can you turn that interest into a niche? Um, you know, as, as, as we have 12 here, everybody kind of has a focus. So, you know, as my focus is hematology, but it's nice to have someone who's really interested in research, uh, nutrition or pulmonary. And so it's, if you've done a lot of research, but you don't want to do it anymore, how can you bring that to the bedside and sort of serve as your quality or, uh, leader in the group. Like if you can come into your group and say, hey, like I've done a ton of work here. I think we could really make improvements in the bedside and I can serve as sort of a leader in that for the group and help improve care. That's something I think stands out really well, uh, either on your CV or during the interview. Great. I think these are all really helpful points. Um, our next question, I think we're going to direct this one to Dr. Foster. Um, we wanted to understand the ideal timeline for applying to private practice jobs. Um, is there a certain point that's too late for a third year for somebody who's in their third year of fellowship? And what about for early career attendings who are seeking a job transition? Is there an ideal time that they should approach application as well? Um, uh, I'm happy to answer that question. I'm sorry, it was a second late, 
everyone for joining clinical care calls sometimes. Um, I think it, if you're coming out of fellowship and you're looking um, at jobs in the private sector, I can only speak from my experience. I, like David, I work with Mednax. I work in Tampa, Florida. And then I work with our corporate offices also, which are near Fort Lauderdale. But I can tell you most practices have openings that come up throughout the year. So there's no time that's too early to start looking if you wanna start a job at the end of your fellowship. Um, I would, um, I think people are surprised, particularly if they're leaving their state, how long it takes. A lot of the neonatology practices in the private sector work with a hospital system that has multiple locations. And um, it can take, on average, four to five months to get hospital privileges and onboarding and credentialing to all the sites. I think that's the thing that really stuns fellows. When I was a fellow um, years ago at uh, CHOP, I stayed as a faculty member and it kind of seamlessly all rolled together because I was already an employee there and I just had to sign forms for Medicaid and insurance. It is not that way in the private sector. So I don't think there's any time too early in your second year. And I would say that practices often interview people, but being in a private practice, whether you work for a physician service company like Mednax or Envision or a true private group, it's kind of like a long-term marriage. You're with those people a lot in a long time. So often when groups have positions open, they are carefully looking not just at your clinical skills and your CV, and they're also closely examining how you might fit into the group. And I say that to lead to Sometimes if an excellent candidate, I tell you in, my, in the group that I have worked with in Tampa in the past 13 years, an excellent candidate would come along and we didn't necessarily have an open position, but somehow we found a way to make an open position in working with our corporate offices. For young career uh, faculty, like I stayed at CHOP, I think as an attending for seven or eight years before I came to Mednax. Um, it's the same kind of thing. Know if, if you're wanting to make a move, it's not you're going to go interview and be hired and then start two months later. You're looking at a four to six month process. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. Those are all really good points. Um, I would pose it to the rest of the group as well, just to see if um, any of the other panelists have any additional feedback on this question. I think it kind of depends on the size of the group, like you were Very mentioning, well. smaller smaller groups tend to have an opening here and there um, and you may go years without one a larger group like ours where we have 50 plus people we deliberately i completely agree we deliberately keep one or two positions open so if somebody comes along that's a really good fit um, we don't have to pass on them and i would also say timing wise uh, just practically um, a lot of fellows start looking at the beginning of their third year um, we've had some fellows um, that um, really wanted or needed to be in Houston for some reason um, where our practice is, and they will contact us even as early as the second year. There's nothing wrong with that either. It actually shows an interest and gives you a little bit more time to get to know folks. Um, but definitely um, post-COVID, because everybody's short, including Paralon and all these credentialing companies. Um, it's easily taking four to six months to get people onboarded and get everything set up. So um, all that being said, if we're constantly having openings coming up and if one comes open and somebody shows up that day, um, we're happy to we're happy to see them whenever. We usually keep um, a list of uh, CVs or a stack of CVs of people that we might be interested in. And if something opens up, we'll start calling them. Um, so that's why, again, it's a good idea to just get your CVs out to as many groups as you can, wherever you might be interested. All right, thank you. Um, for our next question, I'll ask Dr. Heilman and then Dr. Saxon has about this one. Um, are there unique elements to the private practice interview that applicants should be aware of? Um, and what advice do you have for the interview day? Um, I would say one of the things that's different about private practice as compared to academics is there's a lot of variability in private practice jobs. One in the clinical setting, so you, in terms of the level of care of NICUs and where you're working, whether it's two, three, or four, um, or a combination of that. 
but also in terms of the practice structure, whether it's a hospital, you're hospital employed, whether it's a multi-specialty group, whether it's a, like a practice like ours, which is a single specialty physician owned group. So I think it's really important to ask a lot of questions and try to understand what the specifics are of the private practice that you're interviewing for. Yeah, and I think another thing also is it, the difference is also you don't want to appear that you were sort of protected as a fellow um, and you still want that protection starting new. Uh, I think that can be a huge sort of turn off when you're interviewing because we all work. Uh, we all work the same hours. We all work the exact same amount of clinical time. I mean, our group, it's, you know, you do your shifts and there's nothing that sets you apart. And so you don't want that sort of, hey, you know, I had did all this research and fellowship and I had a lot of time and I want the same thing when I'm coming. I want this sort of allotted time so that I can do these things on the side because we all have to, the unit has to be, as Dr. Foster said, you got clinical sort of calls, every, you know, sort of dictates everything. Sure, there's lots of stuff I'd love to do, but I'm 100% clinical and that means the unit comes first and the patients come first. And that's what we look for. We want a team player, someone who, if someone's sick, they're going to step right up and work. Uh, they don't have a lot of other things going on. We want to basically seem like I'm coming here to join your group, and make this place better. I, I just wanted to add something that Rachel and Matthew said, if that's okay. I just, in my old old person hat or middle-aged neonatologist hat, I think if you're a fellow looking for a job as a, a clinician, like we are all clinicians all the time, I wouldn't necessarily recommend if you have a choice to work someplace that just has a level one and level two NICU. Fresh out of fellowship, I think it's really, really critical to continue taking care of lots of very sick patients. Later on in your life, you may decide that you want to scale, um, uh, scale back a little bit, at least as far as, you don't, don't scale back on the working, but as far as the intensity of the patients. But I, the educational person to me would encourage uh, fellows to look for jobs where practices have a busy level three or level, level four NICU. And most of what I learned about clinical medicine has been long since fellowship. It's a good, very good point. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think you make an excellent point because it is really hard if you go into a level one, level two, even if it is the perfect thing for your family and it's the perfect setting, all of a sudden you realize that changes and you really need to be back in a level three, level four, it, it's going to be hard because if you're out of practice, it, it it's just, yes, we can train, but it's just being alone, being on call, managing 90 kids by yourself, you, you got to have the experience. Thank you. I think these were all really wonderful points. Sorry, did someone have anything else to add before we move on to the next question? Okay. So our next question um, focused on educational and or research skills. So the question was, what specific educational and or research skills or background do you recommend for someone who is specifically looking at private practice career opportunities? I think I can. Oh, sorry. You want to? If you want to oh, go first, no, go ahead. Okay. Go, you go first. I'll, I'll go. I'll um, a I think again, it really does depend. So, like where I am, which is a hybrid. If you are someone who's really into bench research and you don't want to do, you want to still do a little bit of bench research. It, it's almost impossible to do it at a, at, a, at a even if it's a hybrid type group. You just don't have the time. You don't have the lab space. Um, so really what is somebody like QI obviously stands out or somebody who's had a lot of practice doing clinical trials, uh, farm-based trials. If you're someone who was active in your, during fellowship, you know, doing sort of joint um, multi-center studies, things like that, that obviously is very helpful and can be done in private uh, as can small sort of chart review type projects, things like that. But it's again, you're not going to have the protected time to do it. It's really going to be on your own time. So everything I do now is in addition. And so you just have to be, if you're, if you're passionate about it, great, but you're going to have to do it on your own time. So it's more of, you know, if you want to still do some research, it's, I can do it on my own time. I'm good at helping, you know, an NACHD sponsored type trial or a farm-based trial, getting it going in the unit, recruiting patients, things like that. That obviously is something that stands out. 
Yeah, and there are options to do that. Um, some of you may know uh, Kasha Ahmad, who's in our group, um, who gets a little bit, uh, earmuffs met, he gets a little bit of protected time to do his clinical research um, um, and has been very active. Um, and there are ways that you can do, and that's in a much larger group. I think it's easier to do something like that. Um, and uh, the contributions are a little bit different. Most groups, um, like you said earlier, everyone needs to be interchangeable. If two people are doing different things, you have different groups of people doing different things. Um, it, it almost immediately creates tension and other problems. You need people to be able to switch around and work as hard as they can. Um, I would I would agree bench research, which is what I did. My research interests, those were former research interests. I, I love doing it, but there's no way I could do that in private practice. Um, you can do some clinical research, especially if you're within a bigger organization. Um, the skills that I'm looking for, the skills that I think make people successful and they overlap with the leadership component um, is ownership. So what we're looking for are people who um, own everything they do. So if they get a patient and they don't know, uh, they don't know what the diagnosis is or so it's a new thing they haven't heard of before, they're going to read everything about it uh, before they go home that day. Um, on another level, it's somebody that I can put in a unit and they're not going to stand for the fact that things aren't working. You know, they're out at a level three. They can't stand the fact that something isn't working well. Instead of complaining about it, um, they fix it. And in private practice, there are not as many layers of hierarchy and you can fix things. Um, uh, the kind of people who um, you put them in place and you can almost turnkey, forget about them, and you can trust them to take care. Those, those are the kind of skills. Um, it, it funnels into leadership. It funnels into quality improvement projects if the way they're fixing things is in a much more structured format. Um, but those are the kind of people you've heard us say leadership a few times um, because your relationship with the hospital is a lot closer. Um, and you're, in another sense, your business is dependent on that relationship with that hospital um, because um, the hospital has to want you to be there and think you're adding value um, to the situation. And uh, you want people that understand that and um, function to always bring the group up and, and take care of things. Um, so that that's the real overarching skill I'm looking for is ownership. I think I'm also, I, I agree completely with what David said. I think, you know, that something I'm, I just uh, stepped down as a practice medical director after 10 years, something I'm always looking for also is intellectual curiosity. I think and sometimes mm -hmm. it's easier to be a junior fellow, a junior faculty at where, where you trained or another big institution because you have so many layers of experts in pharmacy and the geneticist is there and you have a metabolic specialist. Um, Many practices that are in a private setting across the US don't have those level of resources. So you really need to be intellectually curious. I think I became um, a, a better neonatologist when I was in the practice setting, just seeing patients all the time and not spending my time in the lab. And now I'm not denigrating that. There's, there are hats for every head in neonatology. That's how we move the field forward. But I think when I was forced with, um, having complicated patients that I had to look up things myself or figure them out, it really increased my skill set. So I'm always looking for somebody who is um, a self-starter and intellectually curious. I always get irritated when people say, oh, well, you left, you left academics or in academic medicine. And I would posit to you that you can be in academic medicine in every phase of your career forever. Uh, David and myself and the others on this panel, we're just not in a university-based setting, but I could bet you we're academic. I agree with everything that's been said. I think one of the things that we look for is kind of an attitude to service. So how can I help my colleagues? How can I help my patients? But in addition, how can I work with our MFMs and our OBs to create better processes and systems? but also the hospital system and the administration to function the best running unit possible. So we're looking for people who want to improve and have kind of an attitude of service to make the best unit possible. Great, um, our next question 
as um, if you don't mind speaking from a personal note about how you chose uh, um, your jobs and specifically private practice positions. Um, and if you want to talk a little bit about um, the schedules and the work-life balance and how those things play into your decisions, that would be great. Do you want to just tell us who to go first? <laughs> we've also we've also you, learned you can go first. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Pretty, we'll we'll, we'll sure assign you're... the questions for sure. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure you're dealing with four people that tend to talk too much in meetings and don't want to take them over. So you need to tell us who to go first. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, Dr. Saxon, so you want to start? Sure. Um, so yeah, I had I was I stayed in academics for like six or seven years after at Florida and it just got tired of, I had my KO, KO8 submitted and just realized it was had a child newborn and realized sort of like, there's always the triple threat. And I think people forget about the four threat of also being a good parent or a good husband or wife. And honestly, um, kind of the turning point for me was at a retirement party of one of my wife's cardiac mentors and the whole focus was on the career and not about family and then I went to my brother-in-law's wedding and all they did was praise his father who was this very busy prominent cardiologist in town and it kind of just said to me okay what are, what's really valuable in my life and I just had a lot more focus on still being a neonatologist and working hard but at the same time stepping away from academics and so that's how I got up and it took like as people said i started the process really early uh interviewed a couple of times there weren't openings then found a position and then at the end it all fell into place and got into levine children so it's it's not as i said your dream job's out there but it's not always right there in front of you and it takes some time um and it's just a, for me my wife and i who are both physicians we just realized like our first vacation away from and again not anything negative in academics but our first vacation when we were here I didn't have anything to do on the side and it was so nice. I, nice. I actually enjoyed my vacation for seven days and did not think about anything outside of work. Um, and so that in terms of balance, it's you work hard, but at the same time, if you want a family, family's big for you. I think it, this helps a little bit more, have a little bit more work-life balance. Um, I still work bad hours. I still do in-house call work 24s, but I also get a lot more time to be with just my family and not focus so much on getting a grant done, getting a paper and really fulfilling all that academic need. Great, Dr. Hammond, do you wanna take that one next? Um, sure, I think when I really sat down and thought about what gives me the most satisfaction in my career in neonatology, I realized it was being at the bedside in patient care. Um, and so when I was looking at academic offers versus private practice, I realized that private practice would give me the opportunity to shape my career to get hopefully the most satisfaction um, without the expectation to do research, write grants and publish. Um, and similar to, to Dr. Saxton, I, when I came out of fellowship, I was in a busier season of my life and that my children were very young. My father, um, who I was the caretaker of, was battling cancer. So I was fortunate enough in that initially our pri the private practice that I joined was I was able to take a reduced FTE and the difference in compensation also helped allow me to do that. Um, and then, you know, as my life, my children have gotten older and I've had less responsibilities at home, I've been able to increase my FTE again. So having the flexibility to do that was really important to me and private practice offered me that opportunity. Go ahead, Dr. Foster. Um, I think my story is probably similar to Matthew's. I had stayed at CHOP um, I loved being there. I loved everybody I trained with. I loved everybody I worked with. I was there 17 years total, but in the last seven, I did get a K08 and I was working in a basic science lab. I got it on my second round of um, my second attempt after having had bridge funding. But as I got closer to the end of my K08, I realized that I like the lab because I kind of like everything, but I really loved patient care. And that by that point, I was midway through my track for the physician scientist um, 
tenure track at Penn. And I had to be really honest with myself and just say, I didn't love it enough to be in the lab, you know, 16 hours a day and write two R01s and have my articles or my re have research I participate in be in very high impact journals. I just missed patient care. And I had known some people um, from CHOP who had worked for Mednex years earlier and then became leaders in education and research at Mednex. And um, so they served as a model uh, to me. And I think that you can have really great work-life balance. I appreciate what Rachel said. There are younger women in my practice who have small children that um, have sometimes not always worked a full FTE, but we've adjusted things. We do as neonatologists, even in the private sector, still promote people to be able to have, have their families, but you do you work very hard because how you make money is not by getting research grants, but by putting your stethoscope to the chest of patients. I would say you can have really good work-life balance. Um, if you take on more and more leadership roles like I had, you can lose that uh, work-life balance <laughs> pretty rapidly. Um, which is part of why I quasi retired from that role and I'm working on another role at Mednex Corporate some, but I still see patients. I'm post-call right now, but I think that um, it's easier to achieve that work-life balance in my perception in the private sector. I have never looked back. I never regret what I did. I have loved the fact that my career has been in two different realms, the university-based realm and, and the private realm and I'm a better doctor for it. And um, I just knew I couldn't lay there at night and be like, oh my God, I've got to make sure I'm not late to work tomorrow because this grant is due at X date or Y date. So I think I, I have spoken um, before uh, um, at some conferences where I talked about career planning, but I always think of it, it's like, it's like that Greek key symbol. It's your career is a meandering pathway. So don't feel like you have the pressure at the beginning of fellowship to say, okay, this is a perfect job and this is what I'm going to do and this is how my career is going to be. Um, it, it kind of goes all over the place and can be wondering, but um, pr private practice has lots of good opportunities. And uh, I, I'm an example of that meandering pathway a little bit. Um, I was, uh, are we ready for me now? <laughs> okay. Um, I was at Texas Children's, stayed there, loved it, loved everything I was doing, working on my K08. Um, my brother, who lived up in Colorado, had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it turned out that he went into failure and needed a heart transplant, uh, just a couple years older than me. And we decided that we wanted to be closer to him in Colorado. Um, that sort of gave us the momentum to start heading that direction. Um, I, deep down, I didn't like the bench research. I, I, I liked it a lot, but it wasn't something I wanted to make a career out of. I liked being um, with patients, but I, I, even more specifically, I liked figuring out how NICUs run. I got really interested in all the different pieces that you have to put together operationally to make a large NICU run. And in what I discovered, I can't say that I intentionally sought it out, but one of the most important things I discovered when I went into private practice in Colorado at a big unit um, was that um, a lot of the layers went away and I could accomplish a lot more, a lot faster. I'm still in a very safe, thoughtful academic way. Uh, my first experience was in 2008. I went to um, the Hot Topics meeting and it was the one where all the three people that did the big hypothermia studies got up and talked about, um, we've reached the point where I think it was Ann Stark said at the end of all of it that now we need to start doing it. It's not academic anymore. Brought that back to the practice which is a regional one and was able to, I came back, it's so different than at a large institution like Texas Children's. I came back and said, you know, we should be doing this now and, and explain to everybody why and everybody agreed. And they're like, okay, then go do it. And so, so it was me setting up the program, me going out to a five state region, telling people that they were on a six hour timer now, uh, setting the whole thing up. Two or three months, and we got to spend the ability to affect whatever change it is that. 
um, uh, whatever. Um, that, that's been one of my favorite parts about um, being in private practice, for sure. I miss uh, teaching. Um, I miss having fellows, for sure. Um, that, that's the part in the middle that I think um, I, had to, I had to trade off. But um, I've really enjoyed being in private practice and having the freedom to um, really feel like I was contributing to how everything works um, in a very direct way. These are all such wonderful points, and I think really speak to um, some of the advantages of the work life that um, individuals enjoy in the private sector. And um, I think that a lot of these points, and especially about work life integration and family, that was a very common theme in a lot of the questions that we received for today's session. So um, thank you guys all for sharing. I think these are, um, this is really valuable advice and guidance, and I hope um, the rest of the um, attendees um, appreciate your stories for what it's worth, and we appreciate the personal insight as well. Um, we have about 30 minutes, a little under 30 minutes left, and um, a lot of questions still left, so I'll direct um, a couple here um, kind of to one or two people just so that we can um, continue to move through them and hopefully get through as much as we can in the in the hour time frame that we have. So, um, in terms of the competitiveness of private practice jobs, and um, I think we kind of spoke. You all already spoke to what you look for in, in the applicant. Um, I think it's also kind of like a two way street in terms of the interview, and so I also kind of wondered. Um, if you had advice on questions that you would advise an applicant to ask to a given practice to gauge things like work culture, practice patterns, um, and um, how interview candidates are evaluated specifically. So I think I'll direct this one to Dr. Foster. Um, and specifically, I'll sorry, I'll reiterate again, the questions were um, about competitiveness and how to focus questions um, to gain information that's needed about the practice, but then also um, to present oneself in a way that makes them a competitive applicant for the position. Sure. I think, first of all, just be yourself. Be honest about why you're interested in the practice and what your goals are and um, what you think is interesting. I would say, um, having interviewed tons of applicants over time, it is okay to ask about money in the schedule, but don't start that way. I think a lot of young candidates make that mistake. Well, how many calls do you have a month? And like, what is the average salary? Those are important things to ask, but don't have those be your leading questions. Find out about the practice, ask about the practice culture. How long, in the how long have people in the practice been there? Where are they from? I think it's good to have a diverse group if you're able to. We're not, everybody is from the same institution and trained the same place. Um, get a sense then if you can, you can ask about deeper in about the financial health of the practice. Um, I think those are all okay things to ask. I interviewed with a practice where um, half the people had left, this is 15 years ago, in the prior five years. And I thought red flag, and it was a red flag, that practice was imploding. Um, so finding out that a practice has not, how many people have you had leave in the past five years? In my practice in Tampa, it's um, one, so for retirement. So I think those are good things to ask. When it comes to asking about money and schedule, I think those are important things to ask, but I wouldn't do them at the top of an interview because if you don't want um, a practice or a practice leader, the people you meet, because they're working so hard, you don't want them to think your utmost concern is the schedule and the money. Yes, those are high concerns. They can go along with all the other concerns. I just wouldn't lead with it. So my two, my two cents. Thank you so much. These are all really great points. And I think great advice for um, candidates who are interviewing to, again, recognize that it's a two-way street. And a lot of the questions you ask um, feed into how you are perceived and um, your individual presentation um, as well. So I think those are really important points. Yeah, it's not, I want everybody to hear me very clearly. It's not that it's not important to ask. Lifestyle is very important to people. It's just where you place them 
in the interview that I think can really um, help you to shine. Because what you want to know first, is this a group of people I can work with? Work with? Are these smart people? How do they view the culture, the practice? And then you get to some of those nuts and bolts later. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to ask a follow-up question about one of the points you brought up about financial health. Um, what kind of questions do you recommend asking that sort of um, provide a greater understanding of the financial health of a practice? Sure, you can ask questions are, how is your salary structure within the practice? Is there a bonus? How's the bonus distributed? Who makes that decision each year? Um, has the practice taken on new NICUs or increased in size over the past several years? Uh, so those are a few things I can think of that, that give you a sense of that. I don't know what others have. Other people may yeah, have the, better. The financial, the financial health of the practice is, is almost directly related to the relationships with the hospitals and the contracts that you have with the hospitals. So asking how long have you been, uh, you know, it's important to know exactly what NICUs that they're at, but how long have they been at those NICUs? And are there any current threats to them not being at that NICU anymore? Um, is, is something changed? Because there's a lot that moves and changes. The, the way that a practice really can have a downturn is losing a big contract at a, at a particular NICU um, for some reason. Um, outside of that, um, outside of that, it's pretty hard for there to be big shifts. So the length of time that, that they've been at hospitals and and how uh, uh, whether there's any impending changes in those contracts, all that other stuff you said is very important too. I think I would throw in um, asking the I, I, I would want to make sure that I saw everybody met everybody in the practice. That always goes a long way um, to make sure that. Um, uh, everybody is interested. You want to show your interest in the practice by having some connection and some reason why you want to be there and make that clear, whether it's family in town um, or you want to live in that town for some reason. I've, I've gone from recruiting in Denver, which anyone could do, to recruiting in Houston, where we're really looking for people who have connections to Houston because that's what tends to make them stay. Um, uh, I agree with saving the money conversation for last, though it's, it is very important. Um, and uh, get to know the people, the, a couple of things for culture. One is getting to know everybody in the practice, asking personal questions, not by personal, I mean getting to know um, all the people in the practice that you might be joining, because these are going to be people that you spend a lot of time with over a long period of time. Um, so it's important to get to know all of them. And I would also, one of the things that I think is important, I'll end with this, is know how you're going to be evaluated. It's a real red flag if um, there's not a good answer to that question. So you, you want the kind of practice where you're going to get good, transparent feedback and the kind of place where they're going to try to grow you. I, I'm looking for people who are willing to tell me when I do something wrong and can provide me with constructive criticism. And I want them to be able to take constructive criticism back. And there has to be a formal method for how all of that takes place. And if you find a practice where, where there's no real structure for that, um, I would see that as a bit of a red flag too. I, I just, I think those points are brilliant. I would add here that I think you should also be in a practice. And I, I've learned this sometimes the hard way where the leaders are evaluated. So to ask about that, how are individual physicians evaluated? How's the practice leadership structure? And what opportunities are there for the people in the practice to evaluate the people leading the practice? Yeah, I'll give you for, for an example. And of course, I think this is the best way because it's the way we do it. <laughs> but we do, a we do a survey monkey twice a year um, that has questions like, does this person arrive on time and have good sign out? Is this person good to work with? Do they leave? With, you know, a bunch of questions like that. Um, everybody, we go over everybody's individually. And then at once we've gone through everybody else's, we have a meeting where I put mine up. Um, now, now we can do it all by video, but I put mine up and we go through it one by one and I show what everybody, so I know that every, everybody knows that what they said is going to be out there. And we go through all the things that I can do better every year. It's painful, but it's helped me grow as a person. And I think you want leaders that want to grow. 
Great, thank you. So um, following along with um, some of the points that you've brought up, we clearly have a lot of different, several different types of private practices represented on this panel today. Um, so Dr. Heilman and Dr. Stasnos, if you could each tell us a little bit about um, your practices, organization and setup, um, just as the fellows are learning a little bit more about all the options that are out there, that would be great. Um, I can start. So I work with a practice. There are, we are single specialty physician owned. So we have 25 neonatologists. We have contracts with three different healthcare systems in the Milwaukee area and the surrounding area. And we staff all of their level two and level three NICUs. Um, I think one of the benefits of being a physician to own group is that everybody has its own, our say, we um, vote on what contracts we are gonna continue with and keep on with. We can help structure our staffing models. So we really get a good idea and can help develop our um, roles. Um, the other thing is that we can look at our contracts and know what our staffing needs are. So we can either hire more if some people wanna decrease an FTE and have a partial FTE. Um, and we do allow our partners based upon, you know, other things and their responsibilities outside of work to change their FTE over the course of the years. Um, and we can do that because we can anticipate our staffing needs and decide that we're going to hire more um, partners. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and we are much different than that. Um, so I, we're part, like my group, we are, it's um, Levine Children's Hospital. So there's 12 of us here who cover the level four nursery, uh, but it's all part of Atrium Healthcare, which has become probably one of the biggest healthcares, I think now in the country. They just merged with a group in Indiana, it's in Macon, Georgia, and then it joined with Wake Forest School of Medicine. So it's starting, it's trying to bring this sort of academic flair into a private practice setting. Um, but we cover, as I said, we have a, about a hundred bed unit here. And then I have other partners who only practice and we have a level three nursery that's a 20 bed unit. And then there's also a five bed level two unit and another 10 bed level two and another five bed. So we, I think we have like 20 somewhat partners total, but in this type of setting, you can, when you interview, it's you're, you sort of know where the opening is. So either you only practice level four or you practice in a level two, level three, or like more level two. So you can kind of choose. Um, but it's just, it, it, we don't honestly have as much say. We're sort of, there's a lot of administration um, on top of me. So you are sort of, your salary, everything's sort of geared and sort of provided to you. And you have a yearly contract that you sort of get to approve. And if you don't, then you can kind of walk. Um, not as much bargaining power per se. So it's just really working for a corporation in this case. All right, wonderful. Um, the next couple questions I wanted to run by David um, is specific to work hours and general salary range and bonus structure and whether you have any insight on whether the expectations vary regionally um, or not. And perhaps this is a very, this, I, I'm, this is one of my research interests. So I recognize this is a difficult question. So <laughs> if you have any thoughts, please feel free to share, or we can defer this question and um, uh, do a follow-up answer over email for our attendees. Well, I think, I think it is going to be somewhat regional. Um, I think in general, um, if you've been studying this, you've probably found um, salaries at university settings are getting closer to what private practice settings used to be private i think they're all kind of meeting in the middle across the country as a whole um the I'm, I'm glad that we have multiple kinds of practice structures represented here because um if you're in uh, basically if you're working for a hospital in some way or a hospital corporation set setting um you probably have the least um bargaining power um, I think uh, with pediatrics uh, or um, Envision or one of the physician management groups, you're kind of in the middle. You do have some amount of bargaining power um, as a group. And as a practice director, our role is to 
um, get the best compensation that we can for our team. Um, and then uh, in a setting where it's a physician owned group, um, you obviously have a lot more control over, um, uh, over your future and how much you can always share more people less money or hire less people and make that as well. If you had less people, you'll be um, working harder. Um, and, and often that can be a group decision. Uh, a lot of, I can speak for pediatrics, which is a big chunk of the country. Uh, um, the practices, even within pediatrics, are set up a little bit historically. Back in the day, and so, um, there are some practices that have a bonus structure, some that don't. Um, and I think you'll have to ask uh, each each structure uh, if there is a structure like that. Um, then to try to figure out um, what it is that can get some information about uh, the general ranges of, of what the bonus might be um, and uh, what it is that you that incentivizes um, the extra work outside of the practice if you have um, uh, it, I can speak to our practice we have some folks that um, just really want to spend their time um, going um, in and doing their shifts, and there'll be a very defined number of shifts, um, and it is a very reasonable lifestyle. Um, and <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I got distracted. I am in my, I, I am moving my daughter out of her apartment, and she just, she just got the cat off of the tree from behind me, getting him ready to get in the car. And I did my best. Right as I'm saying the word bonus, she walked in. Right as I'm getting to whatever he wants to know about. So, um, so we, even within our practice, if you do all the extra stuff, you make more bonus money. If you don't do all the extra stuff, that's totally fine. You make a good salary. Um, starting salary ranges for most of what I hear um, are around, again, very variable are around the 200 range these days, depending on where you are. Um, and then salaries can go up and there are some, some practices where your salary doesn't go up very much, but as you invest into the practice, you um, can make significant amounts of bonus money. There are some practices that don't get bonuses. There are some practices where the amount of bonus money that you get is almost as much as what um, you might make for your salary. And how that's distributed, I, we, somebody said earlier, and I think that's a really good point, is having some understanding of how transparent that um, structure is going to be, whether it's a point system. Um, uh, you, obviously, you want it to be uh, less arbitrary and have some expectations about how you're going to earn that money. Um, so um, overall, um, having worked in academic medicine and private practice, um, the hours are ultimately about the same. I found there was more flexibility within academic medicine because everything was on me. Um, I could choose not to make my lab move forward, um, but because I wanted my lab to move forward, it was there all the time. In private practice, there are opportunities to clock in and clock out more and have be, be really free when you're at home um, until you take on some of those leadership um, responsibilities and that gets you back to more 24 seven. So. Quick summary, did I dodge around it enough with the? <laughs> no, I think that was great. It's so helpful. Okay. Very, very helpful. Yep. Thank you for being candid and um, giving us a sense of that. And you segued, segued beautifully into the next question. So I will also pass it to Dr. Foster. If you, you can speak since you work with a lot, it seems like a lot of different practices within MedNax, um, what to expect from work hours and how those might differ from what fellows are used to in academics. I think it's probably more hours. <laughs> I'll just be honest because you're you're being paid to take care of patients and you don't really have protected time. In Mednax, there's a little bit of a secret sauce of what's considered a full-time equivalent. And I was just sitting here looking through my files we were talking. It's just north of 2000 hours um, a year. So it's a number like, I don't know, maybe David can remember 2020, 2200. It's about 20, 40 hours. 
what what 2080 thinks see 2080 or 2180 depending on yeah, how right. mac talks about it correct thank you thank you i just was, I'm, i have post call brain so um, they, those are the kind of hours you expect to work. Now that sounds like a lot of hours, but when you divide them, you may have weeks where you work, you know, an 80 hour work week, and then you may have a week where you don't work at all. So there's a lot of flexibility built into it. And then what was the other portion? Oh, I can tell you, cause I, I'm a, I'm a, especially medical officer for Mednex for the Southeast. So I get to see a lot of practices. I would echo exactly what David says, practices have all different types of structures that they set up um, as far as profit sharing, bonus plan, et cetera. Um, it's very uh, variable uh, and it's okay to ask about those things. I think um, that um, the starting salaries can range from around 200 to up to 250. Um, so I think that that's pretty much right on. And that goes across, I can at least say for the Southeast US, that's pretty steady. Obviously, if they're desperate for a neonatologist in rural Georgia, you're going to, you may be at a premium <laughs> compared to being in Miami or Tampa or Atlanta, where there's more of a surplus of physicians, but it's th those ranges are um, pretty, pretty correct. Did I answer the question? Okay. That was perfect. Thank yeah, you. And, and I can I can follow up actually. So a forty hour week job is twenty eighty two thousand eighty hours a year. Um, I can tell you from old internal staffing pediatrics medex discussions, uh, expected average ends up being around fifty six hours a week instead of forty hours a week. Which, if you think about it, is not that crazy. And you think about um, the old 80 hour a week work limit. <laughs> so it's, it's not like the old days. Um, on average, depending on your practice, you might work someplace. There, there are practices where 56 hours a week can be pretty light. Um, there are practices where um, that might be a little heavy, but it, it averages, that's about 2,500 a year if you, if you really want to start to count hours and do staffing models. I would also say, so I, I guess I'm in agreement with David. So I think with the work hour restrictions with the ACG and me, I think fellows are sometimes to find out surprised when they come out into the private sector to find yourself working more hours than maybe you did as a fellow. Um, that's just the honest fact of it. Am I right, David? Yeah, back to ownership. It's right. all on you. Right, yeah. right. But I feel like I don't have the crushing pressure I have when I was worried about my lab, running my lab all night at CHOP and then having to be clinically excellent, teach. I loved all those things, but I just don't have that. I mean, with the leadership roles, I kind of have a 24 seven job, but my clinical time is discreet. And when I'm done with that, I'm done for the day. So I think I've had richer time off in the private setting than I ever did in the university-based setting. Wonderful, it's so good. It's so good to get this feedback from people who are so experienced already in the sector. Um, the next couple of questions are focused. Hey, Tanisha, uh, before we, we continue, I know some of our panelists have to hop off because they're on service. Uh, so I just wanted to throw up this slide. We'll continue to ask a couple more questions um, for those panelists who can stay for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. But thank you to all our panelists and to all the uh, fellows and transitioning NEOs who joined us today. As a reminder, we will be sending out this recorded link of the session to everyone who registered. Um, here is the QR code for the evaluation survey. Please uh, provide us feedback so that we can continue to give these um, sessions on a yearly basis. Any questions that we don't get to today, we'll ask our panelists to provide um, answers, typed up answers for, and we'll uh, submit that resource to everyone who fills out the post-evaluation survey. And then there's the list of upcoming sessions um, yeah, that are as the rest of the job search series. Sorry, and I'll give it back to you for the yeah, next. Yeah, I'm sorry. I actually, I have to take call. I've got five partners that are ready to attack me because they want to leave. So anyway, thank you all for, uh, allow me to uh, answer your questions today and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beckenhaus. Right. I've got right. a little bit of time. I'm just waiting for the cat drugs to take effect apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I, I think about two or three more questions is um, what we've kind of highlighted that are kind of unique and I think would shed good insight for our attendees. Um, 
The next question just focused on um, your abilities to keep up with evidence-based medicine. Um, it sounds like everybody um, on this panel have, has had prior career um, development and interests in academics before transitioning to private. And so um, specifically the um, learner asked about your abilities to keep up on evidence-based practices and any strategies you guys use to kind of stay up on the literature. I would say that you just, you need to read. I would make sure you read pediatrics and JPEDS if you can, the overviews. If everybody belongs to the, and I'm not doing an advertisement for this, but the um, AAP subsection on neonatology, those quarterly articles that get sent out, and those are high value articles. So I always make sure to save that as a reading list. I don't know what David thinks, but I always find that to be very valuable. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Um, you, you, in academics, if you um, don't keep up with stuff, you'll, um, it will be very obvious because you spend so much time in meetings talking about all those things and you can almost just sit there and absorb it because there's so much going on and you're on so many committees and people are talking about things, you have to work a little bit harder at it um, to get uh, to, get to um, places where you hear those things. But, but the bulk of it, it's, I just really never had a hard time keeping up. Part of it is that intellectual curiosity that you were talking about um, that uh, we want all of our partners to have. If you're not intellectually curious, you're not gonna um, be having a fun time with your job. I think most of us, really want to know what's new and what's happening and um, go to a couple of meetings a year, um, structure how you read the, the main journals um, and then go out from there any place that you want to. Super simple thing, every patient I get where I don't know something about, um, read up to date. I have no shame in just reading the whole up to date article about every diagnosis that's new to me that I don't remember and I still get some from time to time. Um, those are great, but it's, it's, I, I have just not had any trouble, um, keeping up, um, with the latest things. It's, it's still one of the most fun parts of the job. So unfortunately there hasn't been a ton of new stuff coming out <laughs> lately, but not lately. I, yeah. I would agree with David too, about up to date. I think I, I sit, I'm honored to sit right now. I'm finishing a five-year go round on the, um, Subboard, the neonatal perinatal subboard. So yes, I'm one of those nasty people that writes those questions for Mocha Peds Neo and the certification. Oh, it's, <laughs> so it's um, pretty fresh for some people right now. I'd be careful. Yes, I know, right? Right. It's pretty fresh. Uh, but I I would tell you that with the other eight people I sit with, when we are having an argument about a question, everybody whips out up to date. So I think it's worth it. Um, it'll have references and you can look things up. There's no shame in looking things up ever. Just remember your textbooks, they're great for core knowledge, but they're generally four or five years behind in some things. So when it's something rare or something where the things are changing, up to date's a good source. I agree. I think in private practice, it does take a little bit more initiative to make sure that you're maintaining up to date. I think now with technology, there are so many resources online, whether it's evidence-based neonatology or the incubator always doing reviews of the latest articles and the AAP. So I think it always, there's good places in podcasts and neo Twitter, where at least you can see what the latest articles are and then go to the primary literature. I just learned about Neo Twitter from Kasha the other day. <laughs> I didn't know that was out it's a there. Great resource. Listen to That's the, excellent. Yeah. Listen yeah. to the. I listened to the incubator. I think that was brilliant that they started doing that. There's a, a, a lot of resources. It's very different. You're in a meeting now, and that somebody says something that you don't recognize, and you can pull up up to date or um, look look up an article while you're just sitting there. It's not like it was 20 years ago when when that idea came out there that you're going to lose all of your knowledge and they used to always say you're going to lose all your knowledge in five years after you're out you guys hear that one back in the day that was the yeah. rule that the chiefs <laughs> all told you it's just it's just not true i think you may have the zenith of your book knowledge like the day you sit for the board exam <laughs> but yeah um here's the good news you won't you won't kill anybody because you are going to your hard drive does get full but i think every neonatologist with their salt is looking stuff up all the time. So you, you retain the core of what you know, but your clinical skills and your breadth increase over time. Okay, um, we'll end with one um, more question and it's um, 
I'll start with Dr. Heilman because um, I think you're the more junior of the folks that we have here, but certainly Dr. Hurst and Dr. Foster, feel free to jump in on this one. Um, what qualities should an interview candidate look for in medical leadership um, and even hospital leadership during the interview process? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think some of it we've touched on previously, but I think looking for a medical director who is interested in providing mentorship to the younger partners, um, really trying to figure out what the younger partners are interested in and whether it is quality improvement or medical administration, helping them navigate what opportunities are available within the healthcare services or within the healthcare system that you serve. Um, I think also it's important to ask about their relationships with other subspecialists, whether it be their, you know, other subspecialists, their, their cardiologists and their neurologists um, that help support the unit, but also about how they interact with the healthcare system administration and their contracts, how long their contracts are when they're up for um, renewal. So I think that gives you an idea about one, how the practice is the health of the practice, but also what your opportunities within the practice can be and how the older partners can help you optimize your own career and what your own career ambitions are within their structure. Okay, I'm just finishing up the meeting. How's it going? I think I'm getting it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and Rachel, I think that was a really good segue into our last question, um, focusing on mentorship in the practice group that you are seeking to join. Do you have any advice on how one might potentially approach a partner or potential future partner about mentorship or any questions an interview candidate might ask to gauge like goodness of fit for potential future mentorship that kind of fits career goals for that given applicant? I think it depends on what the applicant's interests are. If it's in medical, like if it's in medical administration and you are interested in being a medical director, maybe ask, you know, at the level twos, what are, what are your expectations for the medical directors? And do you see any availability in the next five to 10 years? Also, sometimes we have assistant medical directors at a level three. So you could ask about what qualities are you looking for somebody to be a medical director, either at a level two or a level three, but also I think really being eager to get involved in um, the administration. So if you are interested in quality improvement, ask what types of committees they have at the hospital organization to look at, you know, outcomes for maternal and perinatal um, outcomes. So really verbalize what you're interested in to try to seek out what opportunities are available for you. I think these are great points. Um, and I'll pose the question to, to um, David and Sherry as well. Did you guys have any additional thoughts or ideas on mentorship or um, certain qualities one should look for in medical leadership? I just think I'll you have think. to, go ahead, David. Oh, you go, you're first. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I think you have to look um, for medical leadership within the group, which is often more than one person, but that, that you, see someone and you think I would enjoy working with that person. They're going to have time to spend on me. They're interested in my career. They're interested in what my goals are and they're interested in, in, in mentoring me. Um, uh, I just think that that is um, really important. If you meet a harried medical director who has no time and said, well, we have no leadership roles here. There are a lot of subtle things you can get in a job interview okay. that can say, this might not be the right spot for me. I, my practice interviewed a candidate right when I first became a leader several years ago, and the candidate gave us feedback, which was correct. Well, I'm interested in coming, but I'm interested in leadership roles over the next three or four years, but you all have leaders that are so young, there's not going to be something available. So I think it's okay in your interview to ask about leadership opportunities, how the practice uh, mentors and develops uh, in-house leaders within their own group, and what kind of program do they have for that? Yeah, and I, I was going to say, I can 
follow up on that, I think it's totally okay to ask what the roles are um, and be, be specific and ask uh, for examples of three or four people and how they have developed over the last three or four years. Is there somebody who wasn't a medical director who now is and how are they doing? Uh, but it's very reasonable to, to look at a practice and, and see that, it, you know, ideally I wanna hire people who wanna be medical directors. That would be great if I could have a whole group of people who all just wanted to be medical directors, wanted to, I mentioned ownership, own the whole thing. Um, but uh, there's only so many spots. And so being really clear, if you're really ambitious and you want those kind of opportunities and you want that kind of mentorship, um, I think you make a really good point um, that you need to make sure that those things are going to be available. Sometimes timing wise, there may be nothing for five or six years. Well, these are all really fantastic points. And I hope that for our attendees that are still on, um, that they've gained um, a lot of insight into the process for interviewing for a private practice position. Um, I know we're a little bit over, but just wanted to say thanks so much. And I'll also um, pass off to Nicole, who I think has some more specifics about um, survey completion and things like that before we um, sign off. Thank you guys for such a wonderful session. Um, other than there's the QR code for the post session evaluation link. Again, all those who complete the survey, um, we will work on getting the typed answers for any of the remaining questions we were unable to get to today and send uh, that resource out. Um, as soon as the recorded link is available, I will be sending out um, the link to everyone who registered for the session, and we'll do this for all the upcoming sessions as well, just in case. I know that sometimes these early afternoon um, sessions are hard to get to if you're on clinical service or have other responsibilities, but thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to our panelists and uh, to also our registrants and spending the afternoon with us. Thank you so much.